Honestly, it's uh, always a pleasure to be here, uh, back in Riga. Um, for, the, uh, for the first time, or one of the rare times, um, I'm going to try to use a couple of slides to assist in, uh, in my intervention, and maybe I will start with something that I wanted uh, maybe to address uh, somewhere towards the the middle of my presentation, but I think it fits much better um, uh, right after uh, what Madame Sharfstam has said, and especially in the context of uh, judges being hostages or not of, of the situation. Um, and it maybe echoes very well uh, or explains in a way why I have chosen the topic of the principle of good administration, because this is something that is very important, but it's, it's a principle that we like, it's a principle that at the national level we refer to a lot, um, and especially in member states who have their uh, own proper administrative procedure law. Um, this is something very dear to national courts, uh, and an, um, really uh, an important principle of uh, how the, the public authorities operate. But, um, well, this is something that we find in the treaties, but then I asked myself a question, <coughs> maybe a, a bit in a context. This is the question that we, at least in the general court, ask ourselves, I would say in about 100% of cases, very close to 100% of cases, that we ask ourselves, well, but how does this case fit in within the global context of the principle of the good administration is, does it ring a bell? And I think that would be in about 100% of cases where we say, well, this or that aspect of the case does ring a bell. But then I would like to show you the statistics. And uh, here I would, might, uh, I would want to make a disclaimer that whatever I say here is certainly my proper personal view and the statistics that I will give you is something that we, uh, as, as the cabinet, have gathered, because there is no such official statistics on that specific topic. But let me show you something, if I figure out how it works. Yes. So if we look at the preliminary reference procedure, and this is uh, the, the, the most important aspect of the work of the Court of Justice, uh, this principle has been addressed since the early days of the existence of the Court of Justice. And um, it has been said even before it was uh, enshrined in the treaties, black on white, the court ha has referred to the principle of good administration or sound administration as an important general principle of the European law. But if we take the statistics between 1973 and 2017, what do we see? This is, what, 195 judgments. Um, and I have a question, <laughs> an unanswered one rather, but if it is a general principle of the European Union law, then what does the statistic say? Um, and then we looked a little bit as to the areas, subjects, where this has been addressed. It's an interesting breakdown, and I think the, the figures, they, they, they speak for themselves, but I think it also flags out, and especially if we speak about the consumer protection, and the interaction between member states and the European Union. I think this is really a vast area to explore. And then if we look at all other cases, this is barely a one year figure. I mean, if we take the statistics, I haven't checked the, the latest statistics, but if you take what was last year, the Court of Justice has announced, what, about 700 judgments? Uh, half a year statistics for the period of what? Since 1960 until 2018. 
and this is the breakdown by uh, by areas, um, and that is extremely interesting if you look at that. This, I think, is something that that is worth looking at. And then we have the general court, and, and you know that the general court, in, in simple terms, this is the, the daily routine of all the, the litigation between um, private individuals, uh, well, anything that, that involves individual action, in very simple terms. Whenever you have an individual decision, parties would first go to the, uh, to the general court. Last year, we have um, delivered a bit more, about 1,100 judgments in one year. And this is the statistics between 1990 and 2018. Again. And these are the areas. And if you look back to the Court of Justice and to the General Court, that also gives you a little bit of a, of a general idea where and how this issue arises. Yes, uh, I'll stop with the statistics. I won't, uh, I won't spend more of your time. But um, this explains why, against the background, how often do we ask ourselves the question, and how often we have an opportunity to say something, as Madame Sharpston has very rightfully said, this is not our choice what we say. We're depending of the, on the limits of the case set to us. I think there is an obvious uh, disbalance in where is the potential and how often do we have a chance to say something. Um, this is a, a bit of a, of a conclusion ahead of, of the whole story, but I think uh, this, uh, this comes maybe at, uh, at, a, at a good time. Well, I will go back uh, a little bit to the, to the scientific, uh, some of the scientific, more or less academic uh, observations on what, uh, what this principle tells us. As I said, the originally the principle of good administration has been referred to as good administration, sound administration, or we also find a reference to the principle of proper administration. And as a principle of general, uh, as a general principle of the European law, it has been applied since the very early days of the Court of Justice. And um, one of the first decisions that I could trace back, uh, that was the case uh, back in 1963, Alvis uh, uh, versus uh, counsel, and uh, it concerned the right to be heard before the adoption of the adverse decision. What is also interesting is uh, that the principle of good administration is one of the general principles that must be observed in a state governed by the rule of law and common to the constitutional traditions of member states. So again, this is a horizontal principle that is applicable to the European Union institutions and obviously to the interactions uh, between uh, member states and the institution. Um, this um, is what we said in, uh, I have found the, the, the general court uh, judgment in the, in the case Hotel Cipriani. This is two, uh, T254 of 2000. However, this principle does not have an autonomous application. It is rather an umbrella principle that covers a wide, a wide variety of rights protecting the individual against the action of the administration. And it is only enforceable in legal proceedings when it is associated with at least one of its subcomponents. So we can't just say the principle of good administration point. We need to say the principle of good administration as to what. And there you can find in the case of Tillich versus the Commission, uh, T uh, 193 of uh, 04. 
The principle of good administration has a dual purpose. Uh, first of all, maintaining efficient decision making on the part of the administration, and this is how what we call the objective component or the objective element, and protecting individual against violations of their procedural rights. This is the subjective element. I will come back to this division a bit later. What I find interesting is that with the Maastricht Treaty, the European Union has, up, has uh, set up the Ombudsman Office. And if you look back to the original Article uh, 138E of the Maastricht Treaty, uh, that has remained unchanged up until now, and this is what you find now in Article 228 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And that is also very interesting, I find. So the mandate of the Ombudsman has, uh, um, is to receive complaints from any citizen of the Union or any natural or legal person residing or having its registered office in a member state concerning instances of maladministration in the activities of the Union institutions, bodies, offices, or agencies. Hence, my first two questions. Is maladministration necessarily the direct opposite of good administration? And how do we decide, define it? Both of those principles. And second question is, are citizens of the Union or any natural or legal persons residing or having its registered office in the member state, the only subjects that may be subjected to the maladministration by EU institutions, bodies, offices, and agencies. I take as a parallel Article 263 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union that doesn't have that limitation. I will explain myself. Why should a foreign citizen living in a third state be excluded from submitting a complaint about the activities of the EU External Action Service? Or why foreign companies be excluded about, uh, from uh, complaining about, let's say, commissions practices in anti-dumping or cartel investigations? For the mere reason that they're not having their registered offices in the European Union. My question is, this is question, unanswered question, so I'll leave it hanging in the air. Is there room for more convergence between Article 263 and the mandate of the European Ombudsman? Why I'm asking this question, again, going back to the lack of definition of the good administration, the lack of definition of maladministration, um, and difficulty to define the boundaries between the discretionary powers in general and individual rights uh, in particular. The Ombudsman uh, conclusions might be an important contribution to the case. Of course, we would have immediately a question, and we've had already that question in, in one of our cases, um, on the uh, trilogues uh, that exactly run in parallel with the Ombudsman investigation on the trilogue practices. Uh, no, I don't remember the name of the case. Um, um, treated by, by the Grand Chamber. But uh, there is a question of the timing, the, the parallel proceedings. But this question may be accommodated in, in procedural matters. But the question is more of an opening. I will continue. The Lisbon Treaty has introduced a couple of other changes. First, it introduced Article 298 on the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. That uh, introduced uh, a principle of the efficient and independent European administration. To me, this article seems as a being an embodiment of the objective element of the principle of the good administration. We speak of the efficiency of uh, of the public institutions. And second, we have Article 41 of the Fundamental Rights Charter that introduces the right to good administration. Again, this, this article serves as an umbrella element, uh, but it seems a very interesting article, so I shall quote. It may be, uh, it is pertinent to the further discussion. So what have we said? We said that every person has the right to have his or her affairs 
handled um, impartially, fairly, and within a reasonable time by the institutions and bodies of the Union. This right includes the right of every person to be heard before any individual measures which would affect him or her adversely, the right of every person to have access to his or her file while respecting the legitimate interests of confidentiality and professional business secrecy, the obligation of the administration to give reasons for its decision, and then we say every person has the right to have the community make good any damage because of its institutions or by its servants in the performance of their bodies. So this is the right to compensation. And then uh, paragraph four of that article uh, gives every person a right to address the institutions of the European Union uh, in one of the official languages. So then I will proceed. I have two, uh, I have three further questions when I read that and in the whole context of, of our good administration debate. Is the general principle of good administration and the right to good administration the same thing? And where and why and how we should distinguish between the two of them, or even should we? My second question would be, does the principle of efficient administration limit the right to good administration in the same way as, for example, public order considerations may limit fundamental rights? Is there an opposition, a friction point, or these two principles are complementary? And the, my third question is the list contained in Article 41, Paragraph 2. This is where we enumerate various options. Is this list exhaustive? I shall briefly address the first and the third question, and then I will sh shall later give some examples of the second one about the uh, complementarity or opposition between the efficiency and the good administration. As to the question, as to the first question, it seems to me that the scope of the protection under the general principle and the right to good administration is not perfectly identical. And the scope of protection under the general principle is broader than the one given under the right. I shall give you some examples. On the personal, when it comes to personal scope, contrary to the general principle of good administration, Article 41 of the Charter applies only to the EU institutions, bodies, and not to member states. That we can find in the case uh, Bujilida, this is C249 of 2013. As to the material scope, Article 41 of the Charter indicates that it covers single case decision making, thereby explicitly excluding general measures. On the contrary, the general principle may also apply in the context of general executive measures of general application. This is very important distinction, uh, although maybe not visible at the first sight. And, and a good example of it, the Commission's decisions on the inclusion of active substances in the annexes of the regulations. This is a very wide area of EU law, um, being widely and, and uh, actively discussed maybe more before the General Court than before the, before the Court of Justice. As to the third question, it seems that the list contained in Article 41, Paragraph 2, is not exhaustive. And the, the simple formula, the right in, the, this right includes, presupposes it. And also we have found uh, a good example, even if it predates Lisbon, but it gives uh, a bit of a hint. Uh, this is a case of uh, Franchet and Bick, uh, this is T48 of 2005. Uh, in which uh, the, general, uh, the general court decided that by leaking confidential information about ongoing investigation of Olaf, uh, it had violated, in addition to the presumption of innocence, the principle of sound administration. So why is this principle is important? Well, as a general principle, the principle of good administration ensures equal protection of individuals throughout the EU multi-level administrative proceedings, characterized by an executive activity shared by both EU institutions and national authorities. This is a very important aspect of the European Union law um, that I believe maybe is not sufficiently addressed right now. Uh, and this is, again, this is where we are limited 
in what we can say, because this is something that needs to be brought up. Um, and we have uh, an ever-evolving EU leg legislation which grants, uh, at various stages of administrative proceedings, uh, different roles to member states uh, for the preparatory acts and then EU institutions for the decision making. And that is, uh, this is a, a rather vast area and very important area of EU law uh, concerning individuals and companies um, that, um, that uh, is at stake. Um, Which example I can give you? Uh, we have found a, an interesting case, C604 uh, of 2012, um, where uh, the court said that where in the main proceedings the member state implements EU law, the requirements pertaining to the right of good administration are applicable in a procedure that is conducted by the comp competent national authorities. Second, uh, the principle of good administration is also important because the EU judges cannot substitute the reasoning of the decisions by the EU institution with their proper reasoning. And again, this is something that is greatly underestimated by the parties, I can tell you on my personal, uh, my, my personal observation. This is an extremely difficult principle to apply because uh, the principle of good administration, yes, uh, this may be, and many say, well, this is a public order uh, argument, but on the other hand, a judge must respect the principle of equality of arms. And whenever we feel compelled to raise the issue as a public order issue, we must give the opportunity to both parties to uh, present their arguments. And this is, again, something that restrains judges in many cases because in seeking balance between the two principles, we also very often have to give the right, the priority to the equality of arms um, when we see that the applicant should have seen that, that coming. Um, and, and it restrains a lot, I must say. It, our life would have been much, much easier had the parties been well aware and have done their job properly in identifying those elements. Again, uh, there are also limits to the application of the principle of right to good administration. Uh, it cannot be seen as a general gap filler in all circumstances, and this is again, uh, there is a potential, but on the other hand, there are also limits as to how far the courts may go. For example, what can I tell you? Uh, the EU courts may be reluctant to encroach on the prerogatives of the EU legislator. A good example of that is the case of De Nicola uh, versus a European, um, what was that? The European Bank. Uh, it's F49 of 2010. And that decision may be subject to criticism but there is also a good explanation to that. But I will simply uh, limit myself to say, uh, to quote what the court has said. In that case, um, the, uh, uh, that was the civil service tribunal uh, that uh, rejected the application, so it refused to annul the, the contested decision. Uh, by saying, by taking position that in view of the principle of good administration, there is no compelling text obliging uh, the, um, uh, the European Investment Bank to notify to the appellant the ways and time limits to have access to court's proceedings. So that was conclusion in the context whether the administrative authority should uh, notify the applicant of the existing effective remedy against the contested decision. This is something difficult to imagine at the national level. Uh, if, for example, if I take the, the, the Latvian national practice where we have very strong administrative procedure law, the mere fact that uh, the applicant is not informed of the uh, remedy, of the existing remedy for appealing against the decision is sufficient to annul the decision. And this would be the case in many national proceedings. And in, at the European level, this is not the case. There is no such right to be informed properly unless 
unless the legislative act in question specifies explicitly that obligation. Second, the principle does not seem to apply to preparatory acts. And in that particular case, it's interesting to see uh, Sabu case, C-276 uh, of 2012, uh, that concerned a request for information by one member state sent to the tax authorities of another member state under the Directive 77, uh, 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 799. Um, does not constitute an act giving rise to an obligation to hear a taxpayer. In tax inspection proceedings the investigation, uh, at the investigation stage during which information is collected and which includes the request for information by one tax authority to another must be distinguished from the contentious stage between the uh, tax authorities and the taxpayers which begins when the taxpayer is sent the proposed adjustment. And when the authorities gather information, they are not required to notify the taxpayer of this to obtain his point of view. Another example is the principle of procedural autonomy uh, of member states, uh, which must be taken into account. And that was a good case, uh, C 383 of 2013, uh, concerning the lawfulness of decisions extending the term of detention measures adopted uh, with regard uh, to the removal uh, and the right to be heard. Fourth, yeah. the case in case of multi-level proceedings where a final decision is taken by a EU institutional body on the basis of input from the authorities of the member state. This is an ever expanding area. Who should be held li uh, liable in case of procedural flaws at the national level? I haven't found uh, a good case. I have found one case, uh, an interesting case that gives an example, but maybe does not contain, contain an answer to the question. It's a rather old case, uh, Barelli versus the Commission, C97 of 91 where the applicant was an olive oil producer whose application for the EU funding was rejected by the Commission on the basis of a negative opinion delivered by the regional authorities. And the court declined jurisdiction to rule on the national opinion. It argued that it was for the national courts to examine the lawfulness of this national opinion, thereby compelling them to ensure effective judicial review. Hence my question, where is the potential for the preliminary uh, rulings? This is something that is still relevant. Also, these examples, in my view, uh, are good in the context of what I have already invoked as the interplay between the efficiency of decision-making process and the right to good administration. Is there an opposition or complementarity? I think this would be for you uh, to find, to find the, the right answer. There is no a clear-cut answer in the, in the case law. How much time do I have? Timekeeper gives me two minutes. Okay, I'll skip the rest. Um, no, um, the the areas uh, I've given you, but if you look at the at the particularities, I have just invoked the right to effective remedy. This is something that remains rather, I would dare to say, uncovered uh, um, by by the case law of the Court of Justice. We have. Uh, the, the, the answers or the elements here and there. Um, we've also had cases where we decided in a bit different manner because the applicant did not invoke the right to an effective remedy, but it was obvious from the context that the whole complexity of the rule made it uh, absolutely impossible to understand which remedy is applicable and which remedy would not be applicable. So we inversed a little bit, uh, sometimes we inverse uh, the, uh, the approach and say, well, even if there is no such right or there is no such obligation, we need to address the issue from the general perspective that what, even, what is the, the obvious thing to do? What is the, 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 the best thing to, to observe the, the, right, um, uh, the right to be, to be heard and the right to be efficiently, uh, the, the complaint to be efficiently examined. 
Um, one of the most important elements of this discussion, of course, is the context of the right to defense. And again, it is very important, hence the statistics tells us something maybe different. And this is one of the elements that the court would be very hesitant to address as a public order issue, as an ex officio issue. Although this is a principle, although this is a right, but this is something where the applicants must be extremely vigilant. And even if we see obvious flaws, sometimes our hands are very tight. And uh, I can only say that there is uh, great potential um, in, uh, uh, in what we say. Uh, another very good example, uh, although it does not come, uh, it also uh, balances on the verge of the right to defense, and it also gives a very good uh, example, again, on the interplay between the efficient administration and the good administration. This is the case of Conically uh, Steven versus the Commission. This is T 357 of uh, 2006 that concerns uh, the refusal to enter into the premises. Uh, by the commission inspectors in order to wait for the presence, uh, in, in order to wait for the lawyers. And there, uh, the, the general court said that um, um, the commission, if the commission was, the commission agents were to be refused to enter into premises, that would impede the efficiency of their investigation. And there was no insurmountable difficulty for a lawyer to be present uh, during the, the proceedings. Why am I addressing these issues? I will maybe yeah, jump more to the conclusions. Uh, I have already told you that um, this uh, is a point of convergence, as, as, you sa uh, as I have mentioned, and there is case law that says this is something, the principle of good administration, this is something that uh, belongs to the common traditions of all member states. And in, in the growing complexity of the European Union law, uh, that um, especially in some of the areas, um, gives member states an important role uh, in preparing uh, the, the decisions by the EU authorities, there is a great potential not only for the applicants themselves, but there is also potential for the courts to ask preliminary questions. And this is something, as you have seen by the statistics, is underdeveloped, and if you uh, are to address this in the context of consumer protection, uh, commercial law, uh, state aid law, really, uh, you are more than welcome to, to make your own research and uh, think what you can do. Where is the impediment, as I have said? Uh, these are the principles and the rights that may, maybe for a good reason, may not be clearly defined. And as I have given you some examples, the treaties are not also very clear as to the difference between the maladministration, the competences between various EU institutions, and uh, how, do we, how do we apply. I think we will have to see how it works. What impedes maybe also our discussion a little bit, and there I maybe um, go a little bit away from my role as a judge, um, and, and again uh, try maybe to put back a little bit my head, uh, speaking from the experience uh, in, in Brussels, this is the discussion that, yes, we have growing rules, uh, more complex rules, expanding areas of the European competence, more Europe, less Europe, better Europe, coherent Europe, whatever Europe. But where do we find general rules? We, we, we seem to continue uh, fra uh, adopting fragmented legislation when it comes to administrative procedure, because we adopt substantial rules, and legislation on substantial, containing substantial principles also gives us the procedure, but this procedure is never complete. There is vast areas of these procedures that remain uncovered by EU law, and we don't have a coherent and, and, uni, uh, and uh, uh, unique, or what you say, the, the common administrative procedure rules. The European Parliament has been very consistent for many years in addressing uh, the European Commission about the need to adopt that rule. The Commission has 
ever or always remain silent, we will have the new Commission coming in. We've had discussions, should we have more Europe or less Europe? But maybe we should also remember of the context of a better Europe, a Europe of a better quality, uh, and I think that uh, gives a potential for the further discussion and also the academic discussion what could be the role, and especially in the, context of, uh, in the context of effective administration, efficient administration, good administration, and effective remedy, this is where uh, maybe somewhat synchronized approach to, to those rules would be of great importance. And I think also this is where national courts, if we go back to those contributions, and national constitutional courts, uh, as many constitutions do have reference to the good administration, uh, could be of, of great potential and, and great benefit, and it could be complementary, I think. Thank you.